Thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we are going to be focusing on local food to institution markets in Rhode Island. Today's webinar is hosted by the Rhode Island Food Policy Council and Farm to, New in Farm to Institution New England, which is also known as FINE. You can advance to the next slide. My name is Nessa Richman, and I am the Network Director of the Rhode Island Food Policy Council. And today, um, I'm excited to be joined by Tanya Taranowski, who is the Director of Programs for Farm to Institution New England, and Jesse Rye, who is the Director of Farm Fresh Rhode Island. As we get started, we would love it if you would introduce yourselves in the chat, your name, your organization, where you're based, and anything that you hope to get out of the webinar today. Please advance. Before we get started, I want to give you a quick overview of what we'll be doing on the webinar today. Our goal is to provide you with an introduction to a new resource for growing the local food to institution market um, targeting the state of Rhode Island. I will be giving you some program background. Tanya will then share what we know about farm to institution in Rhode Island and share in, and introduce our new online resource bank. And Jesse will then tell the story of how Farm Fresh Rhode Island's Market Mobile Food Hub has been bringing local food to institutions, how it has adapted in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also share his thoughts about what we should be doing now in order to rebuild a better, more resilient food system, including building the local food to institution market. There is going to be plenty of time for questions and answers as well. Please advance the slide. So I'm just going to take a moment to make sure that everybody is comfortable with Zoom, our webinar, webinar platform, and to talk about two of the interactive features that we're going to use today, the chat function and the Q&A function. So to open these two functions, take a look at Zoom uh, and, and use your cursor to open the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. When you see it, you'll see a chat button which will open a chat box where you can share your comments or other information. Um, and then you can also open the Q&A function. We would prefer that you use the Q&A function to, um, to get your questions answered. Um, you can note them throughout the webinar, although we're going to answer them after the presentations. And you can feel free to direct those questions at any or all of the speakers today. In the chat, function will be sharing useful web links and also welcome your ideas and input there as well. I also want to let everybody know that we are recording this webinar and we're going to be posting it both on the Rhode Island Food Policy Council website and on FINE's YouTube channel within the next week. We can go ahead and advance. So the, uh, today we're going to be focusing, as I said, on the, our local food to institution project. Move forward. First, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what a food policy council is and why we're the ones doing this project in the state of Rhode Island in advance. Food policy councils connect interest in hunger, food access, public health, labor, economic development, agriculture, fisheries, the environment, and more. They act as forums for food issues and platforms for coordinated action and they aim to identify and propose innovative solutions to local or state food systems problems. There are more than 300 food policy councils across the country and they exist at state, county, municipal levels. Move forward. This is a picture of the 2020 Rhode Island Food Policy Council. The council was launched on 20, in 2011. Um, it's a statewide nonprofit organization, and currently we have 23 members who all serve terms of between one and four years. The council has representation across every sector of the food system, from farmers and fishermen and aquaculturists to food businesses, food hubs, and trade associations, also universities, colleges, hospitals, and public health and food access advocates, um, and also food justice workers and community activists. Move forward. We can move right through that slide, Sarah. Thank you. Our strategic framework is grounded in our mission to promote an equitable, economically vibrant, and environmentally sustainable food system in Rhode Island. 
advance. And our vision is a food system in Rhode Island that promotes public health and food access, a strong food and agriculture economy, and environmental sustainability. Advance. So the way we do our work is threefold. We build coalitions that align resources. We promote good food and agriculture policy at the state level, um, as well as planning um, in our state agencies. And we also execute high impact projects and programs that fill critical gaps in the implementation of our state's food strategy. So this project fits into the third category mentioned, high impact projects that fill critical gaps in implementation of the state's food strategy. Move forward. And again. The local food to institution project started just about two years ago. It, we're co-leading it using an integrated approach to developing the institutional market for local food with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. We pull best practices um, that have been developed in New England and across the country and have been implementing a plan that has included multiple pieces. We have provided customized support for institutions working with individual institutions to set and achieve goals uh, and um, build relationships between institutional food buyers, food service management companies, and local food providers that result in more local food being purchased. We have also been doing market readiness workshops for both supply and demand sides. So these workshops um, have uh, invited farmers, fishermen, aquaculturists, as well as institutions themselves to come together to learn. And now we have this new online resource bank, um, which Tanya is going to be talking about more next. And finally, I'd just like to say that in addition to our partnering state agency with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, that we've been working closely with other state agencies, including the Rhode Island Commerce Corporation, content area experts, including in addition to Farm to Institution New England, um, the Cornell Small Farms Program, Karen Karp and Partners, and our friends at the Michigan Farm to Institution Network, and of course our funding partners. Um, this work has been funded by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service Federal State Marketing Improvement Program, as well as private funders including the John Merck Fund, the Rhode Island Foundation, and the Island Foundation. So with that, I will pass it over to Tanya. Thank you, Nessa. Next slide, please, Sarah. Next, please. So I'm, as, as Nessa said, I'm Tanya Taranofsky, and my role here at FINE is to run some of our different programs. For those of you who aren't familiar with FINE, we are a backbone organization for a six state network of nonprofit, public and private entities who are all working to mobilize the power of regional institutions to transform our food system. Our vision of the food system is one that is just, equitable, and sustainable. We're working to increase the amount of good local food served in our region's schools, hospitals, colleges, correctional facilities, and other institutions. For more information about FINE, uh, we invite you to explore our website at farmtoinstitution.org. Next slide, please. The reason that FINE is focused on institutions is that they have a great deal of influence on our food system. And we've seen that also through the disruptions that we've been experiencing thanks to COVID-19. In normal circumstances, institutions provide a diversified and stable market, although we see that that has not been consistent under these kind of extreme circumstances. They've been buying approximately 17% local food on average, that's per budget spend per year. And we know that demand for local food is rising. Institutions are also serving as anchors in the community. They support the economics of the region and the community in which they're based, and they also serve a lot of interests of the public. There are 3.7 million students, employees, and patients that are spending time at New England's schools, colleges, and universities, and hospitals, and they are eating while they're there. And so the opportunity to create change through institutions is pretty significant. And that's part of the reason why they were also a focus of this project. 
The goal was to think about how to increase buyer demand for local food in Rhode Island. Next slide, please. Fine's role was to utilize our experience working with institutions and with the farm to institution supply chain and stakeholders to help think about how to increase buyer demand. I'd like to start by sharing just a little bit of information about what farm to institution or food to institution looked like in Rhode Island up until now. Rhode Island might be our smallest state, but agriculture and food production remains a really significant part of the economy. We know that institutions serve as important anchors in the community and they're significant purchasers of food and local food, but there is room for improvement. And we've been learning from this pandemic how important local food sources and nimble supply chains are to ensure food access and food, uh, food security. So here's a quick look at what food production looks like in Rhode Island based on data from the last U.S. Agriculture Census. Rhode Island has more than 1,000 farms and about 10% of its land is devoted to farming. $58 million in farm product sales occur every year. And it's a little, the numbers are a little tricky, but um, about $4.1 million of that is sold directly to retail institutions and food hubs. More, uh, more than that actually is going to find its way into the institutions. It's a little hard to break down based on how the census asks the questions, uh, but we know that also food is entering institutions through food service management companies, other distributors. So the 4.1 million represents the direct sales. I'd also like to take a moment just to note the role of fisheries and aquaculture in the state. More than 82 million pounds of seafood is landed in Rhode Island, and there are 60 aquaculture operations in the state. Maybe more at this point. Despite seafood being an available local product, it's one of the products that we know that institutions have identified as one of the most challenging to source locally. Next slide, please. Here's a quick look at what institutions were spending on local food before the pandemic. The sources for this information include the USDA Census for Farm to School, Fines Biennial Campus Dining Survey of New England colleges and universities that have dining services, and a survey that's conducted by Healthcare Without Harm of their partner hospitals. Based on this information, schools are spending a little over $800,000 a year in Rhode Island on local food. Colleges and universities are over seven million and hospitals are at two, around two, a little over 200,000. Next. This represents about 9% of the food budgets at, um, across schools, about 30% of the food budget at colleges and universities, and 17% at hospitals. Next, please. And this is for approximately 44 districts as represented in the USDA uh, in, the, in the Farm to School survey, 11 colleges and 11 hospitals also in Rhode Island. Next slide, please. Clearly there's a lot of scope for improvement for uh, farm to institution in the state. We know that Rhode Island farmers, fishermen, and food op uh, entrepreneurs have the opportunity to sell more to institutions and institutions to buy more local food products. We know that there's some really compounding and significant barriers to food to institution in general. So this is where the Rhode Island Food Policy Council Local Food to Institution Project comes in and where these resources, why these resources were developed. When you go to the website, this is what you're going to see. You can log into the Rhode Island Food Policy Council website and at the top you'll see the projects bar. If you go into the projects and click on local food to institution, you'll land on this site. And one of the first documents that you'll see is this Rhode Island fact sheet, which captures a lot of the information that I shared in the previous slide. There's also another important framing document that shares details on what kinds of procurement policies there are in Rhode Island that influence what happens in terms of institutional procurement. This resource bank is designed to really help look at what are the key challenges that the actors and stakeholders in farm to institution 
in Rhode Island are facing and to come up with a number of resources that are directly actionable and practical for solving those solutions. There are many, many wonderful food to institution resources out there. And so what we've done is actually curate them to really look at what is most useful for institutions, for producers, and for other actors in the supply chain for, for, for excuse me, food to institution in Rhode Island. Next slide, please. So as I said, there are compounding and significant barriers to food to institution in general. Some of these challenges are things such as lack of processing for local fisheries, and those are really gonna take some sustained effort and investments to overcome. However, we do know that many institutions, producers, and other supply chain actors have successfully overcome uh, challenges to increase food to institution. This new resource, page is, uh, new resource page is designed to provide tools and inspiration to help you advance your efforts. Next, uh, for institutions, the key challenges include measuring and tracking what they sell and buy for local food, the cost of local food, supply and distribution, and this covers a gamut. Uh, it can be when things are delivered, how they're delivered, the volume that they're able to acquire. And procurement policies also affect what institutions are able to buy for local food. Next slide, please. As I said, there are many resources available to help work through these challenges, and we've cured, uh, created and curated a number of useful resources over our nine-year history. We've gone through these resources to select those with the most actionable insights and recommendations and applicability to Rhode Island. For institutions, I'm sharing three examples here that are all linked on Rhode Island Food Policy Council's new resource bank. The first here is a one-pager that covers information on USDA procurement policies for K-12 schools. Understanding these policies is a really important factor for schools in terms of figuring out how to buy more local food and serve it to the students. The second document, Setting the Table for Success, is a comprehensive toolkit for helping folks make the most of RFPs and contracts with food service management companies. It's very detailed and includes a number of case studies and supporting documents as well. The third that I've shared here in yellow at the bottom, Making Local, Healthy, Sustainable, Delicious, is a detailed guide to developing a local food program that was developed by UMass Dining, UMass Amherst Dining. It was really an institutional leader in New England and has a very robust local food program. These resources are all going to be really helpful. And in addition, we also have resources that include guidance on working with distributors and a webinar on how to use velocity reports to track purchases and measure progress towards local food purchasing goals. Next slide, please. Producers are another key audience for which we've developed resources. Farmers, fishermen, and food entrepreneurs all face challenges in selling to institutions. Here in this slide, you'll see some of the common challenges that producers shared with us in a survey that FINE conducted back in 2016. And we've represented both producers that are not selling to institutions in the darker green bar and producers that already were selling to institutions in the lighter green bar. And you'll see that some of the common challenges are low purchase price, which was an even larger barrier for those not already selling to institutions. So clearly some producers are figuring out how to make that work. Volume needs are too large, seasonality, food safety requirements, and institutional interest in general were all noted as barriers to selling to institutions from producers. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of examples of the resources that we've now compiled for producers. They include the report that I just mentioned, the Producer Perspectives Report, in which Fine shared the results from our survey of producers across New England. There are also a couple of guides from Healthcare Without Harm that offer guidance on how to approach institutions and how to develop lasting relationships with them and also covering options for distribution. Some other resources that we have will help you understand the process for becoming an approved USDA vendor, which is also a pretty complicated process and one that's good to understand. And additional information on working with distributors, including the use of contracts, approval processes, and details on rebate systems. Next slide, please. 
And because we know that real world examples can also be really helpful in learning more about food to institution, the Rhode Island Food Policy Council webpage also shares several case studies from Rhode Island. And each of these case studies shares details on what the institutions did on their path to success. Here you see an example from Brown University and their market shares program, which is a common way for institutions, not just colleges, to start local food programs. We also have one of a team project for the New England Food Vision Prize project, a, co a, a cooperative effort between Brown, Roger Williams University, Smith College, and the Narragansett Creamery. Next slide, please. Two other case studies include another New England Food Vision Prize project team. RISD, Johnson & Wales, and Farm Fresh Rhode Island are collaborating on the College Harvest Project, and there are a couple of resources that illuminate what they've been doing. And also, there's a series of seafood case studies. Next slide, please. We also have a host of resources that are dedicated to processors, distributors, and advocates. And advocates includes nonprofits, funders, policymakers, and more. The logos that you see here represent the organizations that produce the various resources, and we would like to just take a moment to thank them for the work that went into all of these helpful <clears throat> documents, webinars, toolkits, and more. Next slide, please. So as I've noted, the resources that you'll find on the Rhode Island Food Policy Council webpage, we've spent time going through the many existing food to institution resources out there. And we've curated them and selected the ones that we think are most useful to folks in Rhode Island and most useful by audience and for the significant and specific challenges that are faced by those audiences. However, there are many more. So if you, this whets your appetite and you're just dying to dig into more resources, you can also check out farmtoinstitution.org's new uh, farm to institution resource database. This is a searchable database with more than 300 different resources. Uh, again, more case studies, reports, data, webinars, and toolkits. And it, it's something that you can filter by state, so you can go there to look for Rhode Island resources, although that will get you just things specific to Rhode Island and not things that may be applicable, but also applicable to other states. So just be aware of that. And you can search by topic and other, other items as well. This is a new thing that we've just launched over the last couple of months, so we're really excited about that. And Find's also available to provide technical assistance for those who are interested in digging a little bit deeper. Next slide, please. So I hope that you'll all find these resources really helpful. We really welcome your feedback. If there are things that you have found really useful that you'd like to um, highlight, we'd love to learn about those. And we'd love your feedback on what's on the website. But for now, um, I would like to introduce Jesse Rye, the co-executive director from Farm Fresh Rhode Island. As a director of a food hub and innovation center, Jesse has firsthand experience with Rhode Island's food to institution system and stakeholders. And he's joining us now to reflect on the experiences he's been having over the last several months, as well as the last few years. And he's going to talk a little bit about how food to institution has and continues to be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Jesse. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Tanya. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, hi to everyone joining us from uh, various locations. Um, first, I wanted to start by giving a quick overview of Farm Fresh. Uh, we're a Rhode Island-based nonprofit organization founded in 2004 with a mission to grow a local food system that values the environment, health, and quality of life of farmers and eaters in our region. We do this work in a variety of ways, but primarily through four program areas. The first is Markamobile, which is an aggregation and distribution program that connects farmers with a variety of customers, uh, which we'll be talking a little bit more about shortly. Um, Harvest Kitchen, which is a program for youth in the juvenile justice system and foster care services of the state of Rhode Island. Uh, our Farm to Community program, which is, uh, encompasses nutrition education and farm to school activities and reaches students across the state. And then Farmers Markets. Uh, our markets are primarily located in low-income neighborhoods and we focus on doubling SNAP, excuse me, doubling SNAP dollars for fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, in addition, we also hold the largest indoor farmers market in New England. Um, my work at Farm Fresh 
focuses a lot on Markham Mobile these days and our aggregation and distribution network uh, that's historically been focused on growing sales from farms to institutional buyers, uh, in addition to a wide range of other wholesale customers. In 2019, our sales to institutions accounted for uh, over 30% of our total sales, which were $2.5 million. Uh, that uh, percentage in the total dollars sold to institution has grown steadily over the past five years. We've developed strong relationships and partnerships with many institutional buyers and um, pre-COVID-19 felt poised to make some really big impacts this year, both for farmers and food producers in our region. Thanks, Jesse. As we all know, our state and our region and our nation's food systems are in a state of real flux and institutional and restaurant dining shrank immensely. And at the same time, foods could be hard to find on retail shelves. I know that you and all those in your supply chain have had to really respond to these changes pretty quickly in order to maintain business. And you've seen how important local food flexibility and system thinking are to keeping people fed. Can you please share some examples that you've seen recently where innovation and systems thinking has led to solutions based on local food here in Rhode Island? Absolutely. Um, we work with a variety of farms and food producers. Uh, on the farm side, it's from you know, very small scale growers to very large growers, or at least large growers for, uh, for Rhode Island, maybe not in uh, relationship to the rest of the country. Um, and the challenges that each of these farms face right now are unique to their own businesses and how quickly they've been able to respond to shifting markets. Uh, there's been major disruptions um, from everything from farmers markets to direct sales to restaurants, uh, as well as other wholesale buyers, um, primarily restaurants and institutions. And it's put, uh, you know, as this was happening in early March, um, you know, it put everything in a massive state of flux. Uh, we essentially saw in one week um, all of our uh, institutional customers being uh, asked to, you know, close their kitchens and consequently a lot of the work that we had done to have set up standing orders and relationships for pre-buying contracts and uh, work that had been going on for a long time. We saw a lot of that just disappear. Um, and then shortly after that, we started to see uh, a lot of restaurants go offline as well. And uh, we knew that that was going to be a, a really um, dramatic hit for the farmers and food producers that we worked with. And we decided to make a very quick pivot and move into the home delivery market as a way to uh, provide consistent sales and some reliable income to farmers in a, in a time of massive flux. Uh, the public's response was overwhelmingly strong uh, and four months in we're seeing uh, you know, very strong sales on a weekly basis uh, for the farmers in our supply chain. Um, to speak a little bit to uh, food producers, um, I think we've seen some great creativity from entrepreneurs as well. Uh, someone that I'd like to uh, highlight or focus on would be um, Allison Bologna of Shreebark. Um, Shri started uh, during the COVID-19 crisis uh, making muffin kits. Um, Allison uh, has set up a really great website and I'll share some of that as soon as I'm done talking. I'll put the links up in the chat. Um, but essentially because Shri was already able or eligible to provide items to schools because of their rigorous allergy standards, uh, they uh, were able to make a kit that was considered a school breakfast by the school breakfast program. And uh, when COVID happened, we were seeing, or Allison was informing us that, you know, a lot of the schools were having problems with national distributors not being able to pack enough of these types of kits and get them to schools because of the, the demands of the free breakfast program nationally. So Shri had the products and uh, the nut free bakery, but they needed an approved vendor and that's where Farm Fresh came in. Um, Right now, through this partnership, and primarily with uh, our approved vendor status with Chartwell Schools in, in Rhode Island and Connecticut, uh, we've been able to deliver about 50,000 of these kits since April uh, to school-aged children. So that's been, a, um, that's been, I think, a really great success for both uh, uh, Shri and also for the schools that are able to access some of these kits uh, through FarmFresh. Um, understanding that uh, in this moment, um, you know, food service workers at K through 12 uh, locations are being asked to do a tremendous amount of work to keep their communities fed and to uh, understandably 
uh, fill the gap for children that are uh, have not a lot of other options for accessing food. So I just wanted to give a, a really big shout out to all the uh, all the folks that are out there on the front lines, getting food to people and doing just critical work. Um, it's been uh, a really hard time for everyone. I know uh, for the folks that are you know out there working on the front lines day in and day out, it is very challenging. But I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for the great work that they're doing. Absolutely. I want to second that. Thanks for that, Jesse. And that's a great example that you gave. Um, you know, we expect that over the next few months, in the next year, institutions are going to be increasing food demand in general again. Uh, many colleges are um, starting to plan their openings and uh, or for their fall semester and many are going to be inviting students back on campus in some way. Hospitals are going to continue to have to think about how they're serving and if they're serving a broader public but certainly um, their patients and staff and also schools will continue to offer food to their students and their communities. We don't really know what kind of pace there's going to be in terms of that demand though. I think there's lots of questions and certainly um, we're not asking you to make predictions about that. I don't think any of us can. But what advice do you have to your supply chain in terms of prioritizing local food in this really kind of crazy time? Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's just so much uncertainty right now and so many unknowns uh, both for you know, institutional purchasers as well as for the uh, farmers and food producers that we work with. Um, I think from the conversations that we've had with uh, schools that are looking to reopen in the fall and uh, just hearing and understanding the challenges, particularly around planning in this time, uh, I give credit to everyone that's working through those challenges at this current moment. Um, there are, I think, relationships that have been longstanding and set up uh, particularly around purchasing agreements that uh, some of that work might just not be relevant this year in terms of uh, not knowing at this point the amount of students that will be returning, uh, also acknowledging that at any point with, uh, with a spike in rates and if, the, um, you know, if we see a second wave coming up that I think a lot of people are anticipating, um, knowing that a lot, of, a lot of the planning work that we're doing could also change, uh, change in a moment as well. So um, all of that said, I think uh, prioritizing work with local farmers, local food, and new partnerships with local food businesses is of critical importance right now. Uh, any work that any institution can be doing to connect with local businesses reinforces trade in our local economy, and it's helping to keep our neighbors and community employed in a time of much uncertainty. It's also uh, something that institutions can do right now to support, uh, to support a local food system, not just in this moment, but through, uh, through investment and through sales, this is the time that will help us to keep our food system strong going into the future as well. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but uh, I know that there's a lot of people out there that would love to, love to connect into many of these institutions. And Farm Fresh can be a point of contact for that. We have existing relationships with you know, over 100 different uh, farmers and food producers. And if you're looking for something in particular, we'd be happy to help uh, play the role of a matchmaker and figure out if things are appropriate at this time. Uh, we totally understand that um, everyone's budgets are completely up in the air right now and any, any work that you can do to support the local economy and local producers right now would just go a really long way. Thanks, Jesse. You know, as you noted, the priority, particularly for schools, uh, for K through 12 schools, has been on keeping folks fed mm -hmm. and um, thinking about local food is actually really important because it can provide really important, healthy, fresh, nutritious options for folks. And yet we also know that there are sometimes hurdles and it takes a little extra effort to think about the local food procurement side of things when and when you have other priorities when your priority is just trying to think about how to get food in and how to get food out it can be difficult to take the time that's necessary 
in order to make sure that local food is part of that. Do you have any suggestions or examples, not even just necessarily from the current times, but of ways that folks have made that easier to make it successful? Yeah, I think there's, you know, examples from uh, before, before COVID of uh, institutions really um, playing a crucial role in the, the development of uh, certain farm enterprises or, or entities. Uh, some of that can be uh, forward-looking work, um, whether that's a, a specific product or a specific menu item that uh, institutions can help farms plan around. Um, understandably, that's, uh, that's going to be difficult this year um, with the uncertainty of demand at, uh, um, uh, at institutional kitchens. Um, I, think, uh, I think right now, uh, some of the larger, larger farms in our state uh, most likely have, um, at least at this point, a bit, of, uh, a bit of surplus or might have a bit of surplus. And either connecting through uh, their supply chains or through a food hub like Farm Fresh, uh, trying to understand you know, with your food, buy food buying dollars what you can do in this moment to support uh, either excess or surplus to help reduce waste. Um, I think any of that would be a, a, a real benefit at this moment. Um, otherwise, I think, it's, uh, I think it's continuing to just prioritize um, local items on menus when possible. Uh, and that, that I think, in addition to just being, and this, this might be the most important thing, like just being clear and uh, direct communicators about what you, what you need and what you're looking for, um, that, that can go a long way as well. And I think, uh, you know, potentially at this time, also trying not to overpromise, uh, just being realistic, um, whether it's our work right now with restaurants that are coming back or other wholesale buyers, uh, we're trying to be as flexible as possible and provide them what they need when they want it because we know that it's really, uh, really difficult out there at this current moment. And in many respects, we're seeing, you know, some of our wholesale, uh, traditional wholesale customers with, uh, you know, their sales are, you know, a quarter of what they may have been last year at this time. And just understanding that everyone is doing their best to weather, weather this moment, but that there's, uh, there's, a, there's a big opportunity as well, I think, for uh, other buyers in this moment to come in and be purchasing things that otherwise would not be purchased. That's great. Thanks, Jesse. Um, we're starting to get a few questions in. I want to make sure that we have time for that. Um, but I'd also like to just check in with you briefly um, to see if you have, um, if you could share a little bit about what maybe you're hearing from uh, farmers, uh, from fishermen or seafood suppliers about how they're, what they're sort of thinking about how to plan for the fall. We know that that's really important and a lot of decisions were having to be made earlier in the season um, as planting was getting underway. Yeah, I think, I think the main theme that I'm hearing from people is flexibility and a variety of options and many of them really dependent on technology solutions. Uh, you know, at Farm Fresh, we went from our Markimobile program being primarily wholesale customers to now being a combination of home delivery, curbside pickup, wholesale, and then also uh, getting back into a, a box program. Um, we're currently packing boxes for the USDA's Farmer to Family program, uh, and those boxes are going to the uh, Rhode Island Community Food Bank. I think uh, from other folks that we've been uh, hearing about, we know that uh, CSA sales have been, uh, you know, through the roof. Uh, many people trying to do community-supported agriculture programs. Um, I know there are uh, some entities in the fishing and aquaculture community that are also moving in that direction. I know in Rhode Island, there's been some hurdles for uh, direct-to-consumer sales, and I know that there's work being done to, to address that right now. Um, I think one of the encouraging things we've been seeing is that we've been uh, seeing farmers come together as collectives and cooperatives, whether for uh, home delivery sales or for reaching uh, new wholesale customers that they might not have been able to do in the past. Um, but it's really, I think, uh, um, technology at this moment can either be uh, your friend or your enemy. And uh, just understanding how many people have had to set up online marketplaces and ways for customers to interact with them in this moment, uh, whether at your farm stand, how you're doing pickups at a farmer's market, um, people are in a, a, a new environment with a lot of that. And luckily there's, 
uh, a lot of service providers and entities out there that are helping with that. Um, but uh, it's it, it, it's all it's all a, a little bit of a state of unknown. I think we're uh, hoping to see um, hoping to see buyers come back uh, more in a wholesale capacity, but also understanding that for this year. Uh, home delivery and direct-to-consumer sales are probably going to be a really big part of anyone's business mix. Jesse, can I just add something quickly there? Absolutely. Thanks. Um, I just want to note that um, I believe that Market Mobile, you know, your your system does accept SNAP customers. Absolutely, we've. Um, We've been able to work with the state of Rhode Island uh, and develop a system where we're able to use our bonus bucks program, which has traditionally been at farmers markets, uh, where we're able to double SNAP incentives. And we've been able to do that for uh, both our home delivery and curbside pickup customers through Market Mobile. Um, last Thursday in particular, uh, we saw um, those sales growing quite significantly and they accounted for 10% of the sales from our, uh, our day last Thursday and those numbers continue to grow. So that's been, that's been very encouraging. And I think as we think about the future of what home delivery work will look like for farm fresh, that's going to be a critical component of the, of our work. It, uh, it's critical to our mission and the work that we do at farmers markets. And we're really excited to be able to extend that to, uh, um, home delivery customers as well. Great. Thank you for that. And then I also just wanted to mention that the, the Food Policy Council and Farm Fresh Rhode Island have been working together to try and get farmers certified as SNAP retailers. There's been a lot of interest in that and that um, I believe that you guys are working on as farmers come online through their farm stands or CSAs as, as SNAP retailers that they may be able to tap into the bonus bucks program as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, reaching out to our, uh, our farmer's market team, whether that's uh, Thea or Molly, um, we can be getting people more information about that. And uh, it's really, I think in this moment, uh, it's even more important than, than ever. I'd like to start um, addressing some of the questions that have come up from our attendees. Uh, Candace Clavin asked, how many local Rhode Island based farmers are selling to institutions? Um, Jesse and Nessa, I don't know if either of you know the answer to that. Um, I, I know that we don't have the answer to that at Fine, but that I also know why we don't. And I'm happy to answer from that perspective, but I'm just curious if either one of you have any sense of how many local Rhode Island farmers are actually selling to institutions. Uh, I can I can speak to a, a portion of that. I know the number of farm the Rhode Island farmers that sell through Markamobile. I don't have the data on all of the farmers that are either selling directly or through other other companies. And I know that that number, um, which also relates to I think food safety requirements that many food service management companies have in place uh, through Markamobile, um, has fluctuated between ten and fifteen uh, uh, each year. So. That, that's a sense of you know 10, 10 to fifteen farmers out of the um, out of the entire network of uh, folks that we work with that also includes Massachusetts, Connecticut, and people from around the region. Yeah, so I can I can try and give a little bit of a different um, perspective, just from the sense that as we've been running this program, we've been providing learning opportunities for farmers, fishermen, and aquaculturists uh, and food makers. Uh, about how to get involved with the um, in, into institutional markets. And we have had a very um, strong response. So we had a workshop last April, actually a year, yeah, was it last April? And then we had one this past February and both of them had between 40 and 50 individuals, I, most of whom were farmers or makers of some sort. Um, and multiple entities that represented groups of farmers or fishermen also participated. We have followed up with additional one-on-one -on -one technical assistance, but more is needed. And I think Candace, thank you for the question because it allows me to make my first plug for the um, survey, the very brief survey that we'll do at the end of this webinar where we ask questions about what this program should be doing next. Basically, the first phase of this project is closing out at the end of June, and we are moving into a strategic planning session to think about what needs to happen next and would love to have input from everyone here to, um, uh, 
you know, on, on that front. So thanks for putting the, sur the uh, survey link up there. Thanks, Nessa. Um, I would also say that one of the reasons it's really challenging to understand what, how many farms are selling to institutions is that um, the way that, that the information about farm sales is collected is through that agriculture census. And many farmers, if they're selling to distributors, they don't necessarily know exactly where their food is ending up. So they're not able to answer that question institutions that are buying from distributors also may not have access exactly to that information. Although we're hoping that through, um, through the efforts of things like the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative, that we'll be able to support common metrics that help people track that information. And that kind of transparency in the supply chain is really important. And that's one of the, one of the reasons I think that um, the kind of work that Farm Fresh Rhode Island does is so helpful and useful is because they offer that level of transparency for folks. And so thanks for sharing your experience there, Jesse. Um, the next question that I would like us to answer is, what ways can institutions support BI POC food suppliers? I've seen lists of local businesses and was wondering if there is a list of farms and other food vendors. Jesse, is that something that, um, that you can speak to in terms of your own supply chain? How are you supporting black, indigenous, and people of color who are farm owners and operators and food suppliers? Um, absolutely. Uh, I think some of the best examples of that work has come through uh, our farmers market program. Um, there's uh, a lot of great data from our uh, bonus bucks program that's shown um, farmers of color uh, selling in uh, neighborhoods where there are large numbers of uh, folks of color that are also purchasing from, uh, from those farmers directly. And uh, through the one-to-one uh, -one incentives for SNAP, uh, we've been able to see some, some significant increases in sales for uh, farmers at those markets. Um, I can say, uh, you know, on Markimobile, I know that we can be doing a much better job of uh, reaching out to small businesses, uh, more farmers uh, to, I think, achieve better representation um, in, the, in the range of businesses that are being represented on Markimobile. Um, I think given the scale that uh, some smaller farms are working on, mar farmers markets uh, have traditionally made more sense. Um, but in this moment right now where uh, everything is just up in the air, this is a, this is a great moment to be uh, promoting the work of uh, folks from uh, uh, many communities in that work. And it's something that we've been uh, really examining and trying to, do, trying to do a better job of. Thank you. Um, I, I think that's really important. And I'm grateful for the question too, because I think it's really important that we're always taking a look at the structural racism that exists in the food system. And each one of us has a responsibility to be thinking about how we can start to break that down through our own work and efforts. Um, I mentioned sh a short time ago, the National Metrics Collaborative. And this group is also trying to figure out ways to support efforts to understand um, where there are minority owned businesses and farms that can be supported and help institutions think about that and track towards that. So there's a real effort going on there to think about that and to understand how we can identify those uh, farmers and food makers and fishermen and, uh, and to translate that into actionable information for folks. Nessa, I know that this is something that the Food Policy Council is also concerned about in terms of equitability. Is there anything that you'd like to add to that, this, this question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the just from the Food Policy Council's perspective, we've been doing a lot of um, our own work in terms of building up our equity and justice focus. I think that, um, you know, equity has always been the first word in our mission statement, but we have allowed the implementation of that across our programs to be mostly implicit. And um, over the past year, I've been working to make that explicit um, and, and woven in across our programs. 
So folks who visit our website can go to the about page and read our commitment to equity and justice, which was developed by the council members um, in a collaborative way um, and with assistance from the Island Foundation uh, through a cohort process that they had. And we are currently working um, to, as I said, to embed that in everything from our hiring processes to our um, standing committees and policy work groups working plans. Thank you both. Um, folks, if you have other questions, please continue to offer them in the chat or in the Q&A section. It's really easier if we have it in the Q&A, but I'm happy to look through the chat and also look for questions there. Um, we did uh, have a suggestion from Peter, uh, Peter Allison. If there's any dining staff who are on this webinar and who are already discussing with their local producers about what the fall is going to look like, we'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you can just make a note in the chat of what have been some of your efforts in terms of engaging producers about the fall. And um, it looks like, um, Kelly, that you have had some things um, that you've been able to raise in terms of the experiences that you've had that um, you flagged that sometimes it's hard to know what produce is local. And uh, she gave an example that even when cases are labeled, um, it's sometimes hard to see. For example, they had a very small print that didn't, uh, that was hard to tell that, um, that their pre-sliced and pre-packaged apples were Rhode Island grown. Um, Jesse, do you have any thoughts about that? How folks can um, ensure that they have more information about what is local and make sure uh, that they know how to find that? Um, I, I know that it's, I know that it can be difficult. Uh, we, we do our best with the schools that we work with, obviously with the tran transparency and traceability in our system to make sure that you know farm identity is preserved throughout the whole uh, throughout the whole supply chain. Um, I can't speak for other distributors or other entities, but I do know that if you make your voice known and you call and uh, demand you know a little a little bit more traceability and action on that, that that's one way to engage in that conversation. Um, it doesn't always mean that the results will be what you're hoping for. Uh, but I think I think that that's one way to go about it for sure. Yeah, Kelly McKeon, I also just really appreciate um, your comments because I see that you're also noting how wonderful it would be to have information about a product be carried throughout the supply chain, and that's the kind of traceability and transparency that I was talking about a minute ago that is um, that's so important. All right. Um, we also have a question from Cullen Namoff. Sorry if I'm not quite getting that right. With the pivot to home delivery, how has this impacted logistics costs of Farm Fresh Rhode Island and or farmers? And or how have folks been approaching the expense of home delivery? So yeah, can you speak a little bit about logistical costs? Is that something, Jesse, that you're seeing increasing in any particular way or how are you managing that? Sure. Uh, first, hi, Cullen. Uh, long time no see. Um, the, uh, the pivot to home delivery has definitely come with um, a lot of extra added costs, uh, as has uh, COVID-19 in general. Uh, we're talking about protective gear, um, all of the gloves, all of the supplies uh, that we need here, uh, increased costs for cleaning, sanitation, sterilization. Um, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Then you get into uh, extra costs for packaging, uh, all of the things that have made home delivery possible, then just, you know, our trucks being out on the road probably twice as much as they were last year at this time. Um, all of that uh, luckily has been accompanied by increases in sales. And at this point, uh, you know, we're, we're managing, but it's, um, it's, definitely, it's definitely been added costs that, that make doing what you're doing more difficult. Uh, and I can, I can speak for Farm Fresh. I, I can't speak for the individual farmers who are out doing home delivery sales. But uh, it's once you start that, you're you know you're adding another element to your business. It's uh, you know the cost of logistics, gas, drivers, uh, you know maybe added insurance costs. So um, just just doing the home delivery work in general is much more expensive. Thanks, Jesse. I think you know 
the idea of um, all of the PPE and um, packaging and additional sort of product, uh, you know, packaging product that's going to be selected, folks have to spend some time thinking also about wise choices there. Um, so I encourage everybody to give that some thought as well. Well, I think that that's going to wrap up our Q&A section. And Nessa, I would just like to hand things over to you to again sort of note about the resource bank and hope that we can continue this conversation. So let me hand it over to you to close us out. Okay, sure, thank you. Yeah, it's been wonderful to see everyone on the webinar today. Um, please note that it has been recorded and will be posted within a week or so um, on both the Food Policy Council site and Spine's, um, uh, I guess, YouTube channel. And um, so you'll be able to direct colleagues uh, to, to those two locations to view it. And again, um, our new resource bank is at rifoodcouncil.org where you just click on projects and then local food to institution resources. And you will um, be brought to the, this page where, um, where you can gain access to what we believe are the top five resources for institutions to get started and the top five tools for farmers, fishermen, and makers. We also have the four case studies, which we hope will be inspirational to you and uh, be good tools for you to share with those who you want to learn more about farm to institution market development. And we also would love for you to take this survey to help us understand how we can help you develop these markets from both a demand perspective and a supply per perspective moving into the future. The survey will literally only take you like one minute and it will be very helpful for us as we move forward, both as the council and as a core group of farm to institution um, folks across the state. So uh, thank you very much for taking time out today. Thank you to our speakers and um, we appreciate everything that, uh, that you've done to help put this webinar and create this resource.